my friends, and welcome to Origins. It's such a joy to have you with us today. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And to do that, we usually interview some creation scientists. We have an incredible guest with us today, one of my favorites, to be honest with you. His name is Dr. Jerry Bergman. He's one of the best credentialed guests that we have. He has two PhDs and a half a dozen master's degrees. This man has given his life to science, and he believes that God is our creator. Now, today we're going to be talking about creation myths have a common origin. And Jerry, when we started that subject, this word myths is a word that I think for many of us uh, throws up some red flags as soon as we hear it. That word is used uh, in different ways in different areas of science, isn't it? Yeah, it clearly is. And let me try to explain what we mean by the word myth in this case. Okay. What we're referring to is there's a group of stories which describe creation. And these are called collectively by anthropologists creation myths. They're not implying either they are true or not true. It's just that's the title we've given to the whole collection of stories. So nobody is saying, and in fact, many people believe that one or more of the myths are true. But they're just the title is given to a whole group of stories which talk about our origins. So it, there is no judgment in that use of that word. It's not like saying this is a fairy tale. Right. It's like saying that in different cultures, these are the stories that account for creation. Would that be a way to say that? Exactly. Now, the word myth is commonly used, like, for example, this book, Galileo Goes to Jail. It's written, uh, edited by Ron Numbers. It says, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. And what this book does is tries to point out, does an excellent job, by the way, this is published by Harvard University Press, that a lot of common beliefs in our culture about religion and uh, science are indeed false. So in that sense, the word myth is used to say that a commonly held assumption isn't true. Right. But we're using the word to say that from different cultures, their account of creation, we're going to call them all myths and we're not going to make a judgment on truth or, or error in those. Exactly. It's, right. a fam it's like a family. Would you tell me some of those different myths? Well, there are a lot of very interesting ones, but let me try to just summarize. All right. The basic difference, if you study these myths, you will see there is an enormous difference between the account in Genesis and all other creation myths. Okay. And a lot of times people say, well, if you're going to teach creationism, why not teach all the other creation myths? Right. My Babylonian myth or... Sure. Uh, yeah. And my response is, one I, excellent idea. I really think that's a great idea. Just show them the different myths and they can see the contrast between all other creation myths and the Christian creation myth. Not only Christian, by the way, but Christian, Judaism, and also the Muslim faith all hold to the same account of creation in Genesis. So it's the same story, which surprised me because when I taught at the university, we had a number of students that were Muslim. And we got to talking about religion after class one day. And a number of them said, well, we believe in the exact same thing you do about creation. It was six literal days. God created Adam and Eve. And the account in Genesis, we don't have any problem with. Although the Muslims do believe the Bible has been corrupted, is right. what they claim. And that the uh, Koran was God's final revelation to man. But as far as that, quote, creation myth, there's no dispute. So these three major religions of the world all accept the, quote, creation myth found in Genesis. And you're saying that if you put it beside the others, it sort of is like a 100-watt bulb beside, beside, beside some little candle lights. Oh, yeah, it's enormously different. And you don't have to say this. The students can see it. When we say the Earth sits on a turtle, and the turtle <laughs> swims in the cosmic sea, and, you know, these, these Which things. Which is the Hindu account. The Hindu. That's right. People read that, and they say, well, that's ridiculous. Yes. Or when they say the Earth was created when God fought another God and split one God in half, and one half became the Earth, and one half became the heavens. Students, they look at that, and they say, well, that's ludicrous. It doesn't mean to disrespect the myth. No. Because it has much meaning beyond what the myth obviously says, the literal meaning, and goes beyond that. But nonetheless, they can see as far as a valid alternative, a valid story, a valid discussion Account. of where the Earth came from, they can see an enormous difference between the scriptural creation myth and all other creation myths. And it's one against all the others. It's yes. not a bunch of them are pretty good, pretty close, but it's one in contrast to all the others. Thank you, Dr. Bergman, for sharing with us. We have some tape from Dr. Bergman being here before on this subject. We'd like you to see that now. Hey, what they've done is when they analyze these creation myths, and again, there are thousands,
they find they can all be put in basic classes or families of myths. And I'll just go over a few of these and try to give a few examples. And the basic groups are evidence to me that most creation myths had their origin from an actual set of events, which I'll stress here again. And the first one is creation from nothing. And creation from nothing, as it says, the creator calls forth the creation. The creator says basically, let the earth produce, and the earth produces. Or let man come, and man came. And besides the Christian creation myth, of course, there's a Navajo and the Mayan, which are very good examples of this creation ex nihilo. And of course, the Christian creation myth, we can see consistently, teaches creation from nothing. Ex nihilo, as Genesis said, and God said, and so it was. Creation from chaos is another example. And we can see the earth and living things form from an existing, existing chaos. This is found in many myths, not only Genesis, but also others. Greek, Chinese, Finnish, Indian, Japanese, and so on have this same theme. In fact, Chinese creation involved reducing chaos to order. So that's a particularly good example of this type. Emergence myths, number three, where God creates raw material, ex nihilo, then shapes it into life. For example, God created man from the dust of the earth. God took something which already existed, the dust, and from this he formed uh, man and, of course, woman from Adam's side. A God a potter is a good example. The Bible talks about God as a potter in, in many scriptures. For example, Jeremiah 18, 1 through 9 is a, is a good example. And the potter metaphor is commonly used actually in many creation myths where God took clay and he formed man or some other part of the creation from this clay. Separation myth is another example. Here, something is divided, uh, such as day and night. God takes uh, time and divides it into day and night. Creation by division is actually quite common in many other creation myths. Polynesian myth, for example, teaches light and darkness were separated by God, which is very similar to Genesis. And this is one thing you notice when you study these creation myths is that Many of them have the core ideas which are found in Genesis. And again, this leads me to believe that all these myths had, at one time, one source. And the source was from historical reality, which is what Genesis, of course, summarizes. Creation from a cosmic seed is another example. Cosmic seed idea, God made humans, plants, and animals. God took a seed, and from that seed, he made plants and animals. Indian, the Phoenician, Egyptian, Chinese, and others are good examples. And the Big Bang, we don't often see that as a creation myth, but it really is. It's just another creation myth. The Big Bang basically says that God took a cosmic egg. And from that cosmic egg, the entire universe sprang. And of course, scientists today who are atheists say, well, the cosmic egg just was. And from this cosmic egg, the universe sprang. So it doesn't have to be ancient to be a myth, does it? No, no, no. Actually, all creation accounts could be seen as creation myths. That's right, including the Big Bang. Including the Big Bang. And so, in fact, I got into this primarily because when we talk about teaching Genesis in the schools, people say, well, that's not fair to teach the Christian creation myth. We should teach other creation myths. And I thought, well, you know, that might be a good idea. And I started to study these, and now I'm convinced, yes, we should teach a variety of creation myths in the school. The basis for creation myths Again, I feel they're from actual events, which happened. And there's many, many examples, which I'll show in a, a minute. Genesis, though, I should stress, stands in contrast to all of the other creation accounts. And you realize that vividly when you study all of these different creation accounts. It's very different, mainly in the way that Genesis is an outline of A, B, C, D. It's very factual. It explains this happened, this happened, this happened, where none of the other creation myths explain the myth in that way. They're typically incidentally mentioned. Oh, when God was creating Adam and Eve, then God did something else, or then, then this happened. So the other myths are very different in many ways, even though there are elements that are in common. Uh, elements that are in common include the Tower of Babel or some similar event. This is found in most creation stories where God confused the tongues. The serpent myth is also found in creation stories throughout the world. There's a serpent which is evil. And this is a symbol, typically, and this is found in almost every society throughout history. And typically, it's a symbol of often irrational fears or, or just fears. 
which is found very commonly in humans today. And could this be due to some event that happened in the past? You know, could be. And of course, we believe it is. Good example is a flood story. And nearly all creation myths have a flood story, which are from study, clearly variations of the biblical account. Although evidence of corruption exists in these. Examples of flood stories would be the Greek, Babylonian, Chinese, Persian, Irish, Estonian, and many others. American Indian flood story actually is quite similar to the Genesis flood story. And the study of flood myths found 95% of them, the catastrophe was specifically a flood and a flood only. 95% also, the flood was global. 88% there was a family saved, only a family saved. 70% uh, survival was in a boat. So these similarities are just enormous. Now, they're not identical all the way down the line, but there are many, many similarities. That's amazing to me that you're saying that as the Tower of Babel happened and the, and the people scattered over the earth, they took the story of the flood with them. Mm -hmm. And over time, it was embellished and, and, and culturalized by the different groups. But there is core of truth that sort of is like a string back to Genesis out of all of those stories. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Amazing core of truth, right. And not only the flood myth common, but also the scattering of the uh, peoples because of confusion of tongues. Uh -huh. That is found in many cultures throughout the world, as well as many other events that happened at that and time. The in. snake doesn't come out so well in all of them either. That's true. It, it often doesn't. An Epic of Gilgamesh is a good example, which historians often claim that the flood account in Genesis came from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And from my study, I'm convinced the opposite happened, that the Epic of Gilgamesh came from the actual events, which the flood account also from the scriptures represents. And a, a big difference is that Gilgamesh, this is a story which has a moral point, immortalizing the hero. It's not a flood account. It is a story which has a background of a flood account. Uh -huh. And Americans are the same with Johnny Appleseed. It's a, it's a myth in the same way. And why the similarity? Again, other researchers, Van Over, for example, who studies this, he concludes the surprising and perplexing fact is that the basis of them, the basic themes of the creation myths in widely different geographical areas are strikingly similar. The story is strikingly similar all over the world. Yeah. Places all over the world. And example he uses, the 300 North American creation myths, have a, a, a very similar core to all of them. And the meaning, what do these mean? In contrast to Genesis, many creation myths, we should stress, written by philosophers and teachers and incidentally refer to creation. The main point is obvious from some of these, they're trying to teach some moral story. So it's not to discuss origins. So why are these similar? Some claim they're similar because they express fundamental feelings common to humans. And this could be, or they provide explanations for things that we cannot otherwise explain. Well, many of these things, though, we can explain because these societies are also acquainted with natural, empirical explanations. The ancients were not stupid, and the ancients had a tremendous amount of insight and knowledge that, and we're really selling them short by viewing their creation myths as the product of ignorance. And in many cases, the creation myths contain a lot of insight about psychology. And the current times, in spite of an increased knowledge, much today still exists about which we remain ignorant. So in many ways, we know much more than the ancients, but in many ways, we have the same questions that they did, for example, about where we came from. We're no closer today in solving many of these problems than were the ancients. Where do human beings come from? In many ways, we're no closer to solving this corundum than the ancients were. And uh, origin of life is the example I give uh, here. So in many ways, life has not changed uh, today compared to 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. So we have similar needs and similar concerns. Eating, sleeping, working, loving, we're all pretty much the same since the start of recorded history. And except for lacking modern gadgetry, in many ways, ancient life was very similar to that of today. So we same must- basic philosophical questions at the bottom of all of it. Right, so in many ways, our needs and our 
questions that we have haven't changed in, in thousands of years. So when you look at all of this, Jerry, you don't see all of these myths as a threat to the truth of God's Word. You see it as a confirmation of the right. truth of God's Word, that out of this basic record of what God did sprang all of these embellished stories that are almost universal around the world. But we've got to take a break right now. So don't you go away, and don't you go away. We'll be back in a minute, and we'll talk about these thousands of myths and our history and and how it all applies to the truth of God's creation. You stay right there. We'll be back with you in just a minute. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Monarch butterfly, miraculous metamorphosis. The monarch butterfly has some amazing abilities that any designer would be proud of. As a caterpillar, it increases its weight 2,700% in 20 days, ingesting only one type of plant, the milkweed, which is poisonous to other animals. The female can smell a male butterfly up to two miles away. It navigates alone to a never-before-seen location over 2,000 miles away. Random chance processes explaining this unusual creature is beyond the realm of reason. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Jerry Bergman, is the author of several books, including Slaughter of the Dissidents, Killing the Careers of Darwin Doubters, and Persuaded by the Evidence. For book orders, go to Amazon.com. Dr. Bergman has presented over 100 scientific papers at professional conferences, has over 800 publications, and is a frequent guest on radio and television programs. Dr. Bergman is also a professor at Northwest State College in Ohio, where he teaches biology and chemistry courses. For more information about our guest, you can write to Dr. Jerry Bergman at Northwest State Community College. His email address is jbergman at northweststate.edu. Yeah, we're back from, from break, and I'm here with Dr. Jerry Bergman. We're talking about creation myths. And uh, Dr. Jerry, I just need to say to you, in all my life as, a, as an evangelical Christian, I'm told that because I believe the Bible is inerrant, that I'm taking it too literal. Uh, it seems to me sometimes it isn't symbolic versus literal. It's what is history? What are the words saying and telling us? Is that right? Yeah, this is a good point. The Bible has to be understood, but every document has to be understood. It's a matter of every sentence being understood. And Ken Ham likes to stress that we look at the historical interpretation. We try to understand the words in Scripture according to history, which I think is a better way of understanding what they have to say because, of course, we take all sentences we read historical according to our understanding of history. Words or at least have to mean something, don't they? They have to mean something. and they, right. all must, they all must be interpreted. That's right. And the problem in understanding the symbolism of course, also exists interpreting the Hebrew creation account. Well, this is true with all creation accounts. We have to try to understand what they're trying to say, not just the Hebrew, but all the others as well. An advantage today that we have, though, in understanding the Hebrew and Greek, in other words, the scriptures, is that we have a huge body of literature about them compared to the dead culture. It's hard to understand the Mayan creation myth because we don't have much information about Mayan culture, period but we have a huge amount of information about Greek and Hebrew culture. Therefore, it's far easier to understand what these cultures had to say in their writings, such as in the Christian Greek and Hebrew scriptures. Evidence for the creation story. We have a huge number of manuscripts for Genesis. In fact, we have more than for all other ancient creation accounts combined. So we can understand the Genesis creation myth far more so because we have so much more information relative to not only the historical account but also the manuscripts. So we can be assured that the scriptures we have today are very close to the original autographs. Genesis also has been more extensively studied than any other ancient creation account. So many people have studied the other creation accounts but far more have studied Genesis. So we have more understanding of this account. And Genesis was validated by Christ, the apostles, and the early church. And nonetheless, as is true of all creation myths, biblical account uses figures of speech and allegories. So we have to acknowledge that they are there. And of course, a good example is the Bible talks about the earth's four corners. Well, no one believes the earth has four corners. Of course, it's not a cube. And therefore, we have to understand these for what they mean. 
and they mean the same thing they mean today. If I said I've traveled to the Earth's four corners, you would understand without a problem exactly what that refers to. So the problem is determining which statements are symbolic and which statements are to be taken exactly as they are stated. Another point that I want to stress, the Hebrew account stands far apart from the others. The Genesis story is a description of what happened, void of pagan embellishments, as one author stated. And Genesis is in stark contrast to comparable ancient concepts. And I think one way of understanding this is to study different creation myths. And this is why I think it's important for students to study other creation myths so they can appreciate the difference between Genesis but you've showed us what makes them similar, what makes it in stark contrast. You're saying this seems to be much more of a straight historical account rather than an embellished story with, that's making moral points. Is that right, it? Right, right. And that's apparent when you read it because the Genesis account is very factual. It states this happened, this happened, this happened, right. and this happened. All the others are obviously embellished because they talk about Zeus and they talk about the earth being supported by four pillars and the four pillars are held up by 16 elephants and the elephants swim and on turtles in a cosmic sea and so on. And so these are obviously embellishments which no one would today accept as, as valid. But we're not trying to criticize these cultures. To them, it had a great deal of meaning, right. just like Johnny Appleseed has a great deal of meaning to us today, or Santa Claus right. has a great deal of meaning to us today. So we must understand the words in the historical context and not criticize the ancient cultures. Okay, I got you. And um, Genesis, as I stressed, as a matter of fact, summary of creation. And I think probably the one who uh, summarized this the best is an atheist called Isaac Asimov, who just died a few years ago, and he concluded, which I will quote, the Bible writers labored to produce something that was as reasonable and as useful as possible. In doing so, they succeeded wonderfully. There is no version preceding the discoveries of modern science that is as rational and as inspiring as that of Genesis. This was stated by an atheist, and I think he said it much better than I could ever state it. And this indeed is the central difference between the Genesis creation account and the other creation accounts. Should we study different creation myths in the schools? Well, I think that's an important part of our curriculum. So we should study different creation myths. In fact, today the stress is on cultural diversity. And this would fit right in with the current trend in education to teach about other cultures. And in short, I think schools have a obligation to meet this legitimate educational need and therefore I think creation myths should be taught as part of the curriculum of high schools and colleges. Dr. Jerry, I just want to say thank you. This is a uh, unique presentation that you brought to us and we're very grateful. I, uh, the part of it that, that jumps out to me and excites me the most is, you know, as a Christian, I've never wanted to be afraid of the truth. I wanted to search for the truth because our God is the God of truth. And you have done that. You've given your life to studying truth. And as you've studied the truth, you have proven the truth of God's word. And you're telling us that all of these thousands of creation stories don't disvaluate God's word. They validate God's word. And they show us that, in fact, our God is the God of creation. And that the his history of Genesis is the basis upon which all of these embellished myths uh, it's the core out of which they all spring. Friends, I just want to tell you that you never have to be afraid of the truth either. You never have to be afraid of learning and studying and growing because all truth is going to bring you back to the real truth, and the real truth is Jesus Christ and His Word. We're so glad you've joined us today on Origins. If you have questions, be sure and write us at Origins CTV Wall PA or get on our website at www.originstv.org. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, I just want you to remember that it's God's view that he created you. And that should be your worldview too. God bless you till next time.
thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 914 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 914, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.